Welcome to episode five of our Hidden London Hangouts. These are becoming quite popular and it's so lovely to get your feedback on all of these. Uh, we are collecting all the lovely words and of course we tell the bosses because that's what we do. Um, we're also uh, attracting quite a lot of compliments from all around the world, which is really nice. And we get lots more subscriptions to the YouTube channel, which is really good as a result of this. Keep doing that down below, subscribe, and then make your comments on what you see and join in the conversation to the side. Joining me today to talk about something very different in London's skyline, there's your clue, is my usual team plus one. So first of all, Chris Nix from the London Transport Museum, how are you? Hi Alex, I'm very well thank you, yeah, yeah all good. You're wearing a jacket. I know, I, I figured, uh, it's, it's um, despite the fact it's a hot day, it just felt right for a jacket. Okay, well, look, would you mind if I wear one? Because I've oh, sure. um, got my old um, Monarch Airlines high vis jacket. <laughs> so I just wondered if it might be okay if I wear that while you wear a jacket. Is that all right? I do hope there's no sponsorship involved. Look, I mean, it's got my like, proper, <laughs> probably Monarch. <long. laughs> I think that's quite good, actually, don't you? I could sit here like this, couldn't I? Like some sort of uh, health and safety expert. Uh, Siddy Holloway, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm fine now. I've got rid of the high-vis jacket. And uh, how, and before we go on, by the way, remind me how you got your name. Because someone said to me, Siddy Holloway, she's Icelandic. How is she called Holloway? Okay, yeah, so I said, I told this story in the first episode. Um, I came to uh, Britain to study drama so I went to drama school and when I was graduating drama school and I was getting I got an agent uh, one of the things they said to me is that well Ingolf's daughter which is my real last name is a bit of a mouthful so you should try to think of a stage name that would suit you know your first name better which is Siddy um, and I searched high and low and tried every you know iteration of my name as I could think and then one day I was returning from my aunt's house who lived in Cockfosters and the next uh, station on the line was Holloway Road and I just thought Holloway yeah better than City Arsenal wasn't it uh, Laura Hilton Brown <laughs> uh, how are you I am very well, Alex, thank you. And I don't know why you're laughing at high vi jackets, because when I'm at work, I spend 90% of my time in one of those. So glad. I'm really, yeah, really exactly. <laughs> I'm really glad. Uh, awesome stuff. And today we've got a special guest, and I'm very, very excited because we've gone transatlantic today. Uh, we have what's known in the trade as an interpretation specialist. For me, it's a punter's pal. She goes around places and says, why should I care? What is that all about? Who'd be interested in this? Her name is Helen Diviak and she's with us today. Hi, Helen. Hi. Look at that amazing poster in the background. Tell us about that. It's an underground poster, isn't it? It is. Um, so as you probably know, the uh, LTM does reproductions of historic posters. Um, I've been buying them since, well, since I can remember. And this is one of my very favorites. It's, been in my room since I was at university um, a long time ago and it's just obviously I've moved rooms since then I'm not still at university <laughs> <I'm> still <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's something you know where it's warm and bright it just gives me that happy feeling of, of being in London and being somewhere cozy so I thought it would I be love appropriate. It. And thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today there is a reason why Helen's here because Helen used to work for the London Transport Museum some time ago when the tours were being designed and created and stuff like that and actually Helen is perfect for this because today we've chosen a venue which is not available for tour it's somewhere which used to be but is now just um the, the beautiful pictures and you can go and visit it from the outside it's just as beautiful as it is on the inside I'm going to just take you back to a moment in time when if you looked at London's skyline St Paul's used to brood over the city and it used to show that religion was the most important thing. Churches, cathedrals, big religious buildings, towered over everything else. As time's gone on, money has become possibly a great god and skylines are now full of skyscrapers. And London Transport had its very own. In fact, it was the first skyscraper uh, in London and it was 55 Broadway, the headquarters. And today we're gonna to take a look around the inside and the outside of this phenomenal building. So first of all, I love, talking to Laura about her thoughts on stuff because it's just you're like me you're a punter and you go to these places what do you like about the place Laura? So 55 Broadway for us was about going behind closed doors but in a different capacity to what we did with some of the other London uh, hidden London tours so instead of going down beneath the streets we went up 
and this tour took people right up, like you said, into London's skyline. Phenomenal panoramic views when you get to the um, when you get to the tenth floor, and we were able to take people up to the fourteenth floor flagpole. God, that was a little bit of a tongue twister. Flagpole terrace too, um, which was my my favourite moment of the tour. Um, to begin with, I was a little bit kind of underwhelmed with Broadway as a tour, and then it grew on me, and it grew on me massively because the building is it's remarkable, it's grand, it's decorative, it represented architecture. And it was significant in London's transport history as well, which the team are probably going to go into in much more depth in, in this hangout. But the tour itself uh, took in the interior and the exterior of the building. And I think sometimes people, um, they, they didn't understand the architecture and design on the exterior of the building. So that was a really nice way to start the tour. And we basically wove our way up the floors um, and it ended up right at the top where, yeah, the views were fantastic. I love it. We'll find out more about how it was built uh, in the course of the next few minutes. But let's go to America because um, the, the home of steel structures has got to be New York. And Helen is there. Helen used to work for the museum and came up with the idea of this plan. So, Helen, what was it when you walked around your basically your boss's office? What was it that made you think that this place was worth a tour for the public? Well, I, I think one of the, the first things that struck me is um, my parents actually used to live near St. James's Park. And so I would go visit them quite often. But very rarely when we're in cities do we look up. So, you know, as Laura was talking about, we're so focused on being busy and getting to where we're going or often, you know, going underground into the tube. And I remember looking up one day and being just absolutely struck by this building that I had walked by, you know, dozens of times, but never really paid attention to. And then once you start seeing the, the drama and the grandeur of this building, I got really curious about it. Now, of course, there's the facts of it being London's first skyscraper. Of course, it was never London's tallest structure, as you pointed out. Um, but this idea of an office building, of economy, of transport being something that represented modernity, that represented what London was going to be in the 20th century, I think was really, really exciting. And that, just as Laura said, the more that you dug into it, the more interesting it became, the more little facts and figures and stories and the, the human stories that come out of this, this space are really what makes it an interesting, um, an interesting tour, an interesting place to explore. And a true bit of the tube, really, because it was not only the headquarters, it was also a part of it was part of St. James's Park tube station downstairs. It looks mm -hmm. stunning from the outside. It's quite, quite close to Victoria Station, if you get any idea. As I say, it's right on top of St. James's Park Tube. And it is a, a phenomenal building from the outside. And as you rightly said, we spend all our time looking at our phones these days. If you park your phone and put it in your pocket for a minute and look up at that building, you will be astounded by what you see. And we're going to see some of that in a minute. First of all, Chris, you're always so good at just potting the history of these places. Just do that for us now, would you? Well, thank you. Um, so the reason that uh, 55 Broadway is part of the Hidden London series is actually technically, I mean, I've got 55 Broadway up on the Randall today, but actually I could equally well have this one. <laughs> uh, you've referenced it already. Um, St. James's Park is uh, a note, but it is the two S's with the apostrophe on this one. Um, the, um, St. James's Park is actually um, built into 55 Broadway, as you've mentioned, and part of it, uh, which when it was offices, uh, stopped being part of that station, is therefore technically a disused part of a station, which is why it felt like it belonged in the Hidden London family. But to wind back to what was there before, we know the area as being, you know, this being a, a very grand building, really grand building, um, in an area which has become ground with it. But if you wind back before it was there, it was a rough area, it was a slum, wasn't nice at all. Um, but what was there was the Metropolitan District uh, Railway, um, who owned a piece of land for their headquarter building and had built St James's Park Station there. So in 1868, you've got the station already there and you've got a headquarter building for one of the privately owned railway companies. Um, and so that site, when, uh, when the underground lines are being banded together, still private, but banded together, um, that site is an obvious central London place, 
where a, a bigger headquarters could be built. And in the mid 20s, that's what um, uh, the underground uh, group starts to look at. Um, and in 1927, uh, Charles Holden, the architect, is given the task of um, building this, uh, this amazing thing that we know today. You've already referenced it has a steel frame. Now the, 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 um, uh, the home of steel frame buildings is actually Chicago. Um, a lot of the rebuild after the great fires in Chicago had pioneered taller buildings that uh, could, uh, you know, the, the, the form could uh, be freed up by, by having a steel frame. And that's what they did. Charles Holden was able to reconcile this really, really awkward site. Uh, it's a funny shape. Um, build this steel frame structure, which um, is in a cruciform shape. Uh, meant that people could easily walk straight through it and into the, the station at St. James Park. And it also meant they could build it phenomenally quickly. So it was built in two years, opened by 1929 as this dramatic skyscraper, uh, lavishly on, uh, built on the outside and on the inside, Portland stone, you know, really, really amazing looking thing. Um, and that really is, it, it has remained uh, from the exterior at least largely unchanged since uh, until the present day. Um, what I think well, was very interesting as well, Chris, when you were just mentioning um, about the slums and the fact that 55 Broadway was put in the middle of a slum area, so was the land around Aldwych tube, uh, tube Station that we did in the first episode. And the area between Hoban and Aldwych, depending on if you say Holborn or Hoban, and Aldwych was slum. And the British Broadcasting Corporation put a bush house in the middle of a slum to give people aspiration that their world could be better. And it's interesting that 55 Broadway, the headquarters of the transport network, was also put in a slum. I wonder if there's anything in the two of their locations being something almost aspirational about getting out of the world you've got into something that you want to be in. I think large civic buildings are often used as an opportunity to be at the centre of a master plan. If you think about a more recent example of Canary Wharf uh, redevelopment, which you know was a brownfield derelict site, um, put a station there so that people can get to it, build some grand buildings, and it is transformed from what it was before. So you're right, they're, they're very, very powerful things. And I think um, the, the people commissioning it, Lord Ashfield is the the, the chair of the company uh, uh, and Frank Pitt, they chose well in Charles Holden as somebody who was able to drive forward something that was utterly radical, looked out of place really in its environment for certainly for the start of its life. Um, so yeah, a really visionary, a really visionary piece of building there. Should we have a bit of vision then? City Slideshow, it's a regular, wonderful appearance on these uh, hangouts. Uh, City always gathers the most beautiful pictures and um, let's hope she's Got some crackers today. Oh, isn't it? See, it's the plot is odd, isn't it? It had to be yeah. a strange shaped building to make well, sure that you could get offices with windows, I guess. But also, it was just because that it was the way of the of what the plot of land actually looked like. So it was like a kind of trapezium, weird sort of offset diamond that they had to build upon. And uh, I noticed that you said, you know churches and cathedrals had been kind of the the driving force of grand buildings in london before this one well 55 broadway is often called a cathedral of modernism because it was uh, basically a, a perfect example of british modernism at the time and, it, and you can definitely see that there so uh you know in a way it's a cathedral of its own and it is built in a cruciform shape which is normally reserved for ecclesiastical buildings yeah the cross so, is there so it even has a flying buttress if you look carefully as well on the side. I beg your pardon? I said it even has a flying buttress. If you look uh, in that crick of the building, um, it's about seven or eight stories up. Right, flying buttresses. Flying well, you buttress. get in your private life is your own business. <laughs> <laughs> and, now, and of um, course the, the building was, was clad in Portland stone, which is the same stone that was used what, for Buckingham Palace for um, St. Paul's. So they were using a, a material that was reserved for some of the finest buildings in London, but in a very, um, well, by the standards of that day, in a reserved way in, in terms of the ornamentation that was um, used. It's stripped back, very modern. 
And it looks, it does remind me of some of Charles Holden's tube stations as well, because he designed tube stations as well, didn't he? He did. Now, um, this is what that building could have looked like had the underground group gone with the design by their resident architect, Stanley Heaps. So he submitted this idea for, for, the, for the building um, and then Frank Pick and, and, and Lord Ashwell decided to go with Holden instead of, of, of Stanley Heaps. It's a very different building if you, I mean, I'm sure you all agree. And also, um, you know, it's much more in keep with what was, I mean, commonplace at the time. That would have yep. fitted in much better, quote unquote, than, than what they came up with in, in the end. So it's really interesting to see that, that contrast of what that corner could have looked like. Well, it looks a bit like Whiteley's of Bayswater, doesn't it? It's got a little bit of a look of Whiteley's of Bayswater. Um, and I have to say, I think for the, for the headquarters of London Underground, I prefer the 55 Broadway that they came up with. That design would have been incredibly gloomy inside because yeah. there's very little windows and those who had the misfortune to be in the heart of the office would have had no natural daylight. Yeah. Now, um, the man we've been talking about, Charles Holden himself, um, you know how we've spoken about Leslie Green in yeah. the past? Uh, so there are sort of often two great architects connected with the underground that you have Leslie Green with those Oxblood red tile tiled stations of the early tubes. And then you have uh, Charles Holden. Interestingly enough, they were born in the same year. Were they really? Yeah, they were in 1875. So um, Leslie Green unfortunately died very young at the age of, I think, 33 from tuberculosis. So um, Charles Holden just got kind of a, a start much later on designing tube stations, but they were in fact born in the same year, which I think is quite fascinating. And it's the interwar period, isn't it? It was 1929 when it was completed, wasn't it? Yeah, so Charles's, Charles Holden's first, um, first commission for the underground group was to rebuild the entrance of Westminster Station in 1923. And they liked his work so much that they commissioned him later to, to build the extension of the Northern Line. He built Piccadilly Circus and then later on the extensions uh, of the Piccadilly Line. So he did extensive work with the underground group. Um, Interesting. So, um, Chris, did um, Charles Holden design East Finchley? There's a lot of the uh, stations on the extensions of Knowles and M Piccadilly line that uh, were his, and yeah, there, yeah, that's one. There is 55 Broadway being constructed. Again, we've talked about steel frame structures before. This is literally the ultimate first steel frame building in a sense. So there were uh, something like 700 steel beams that go up through the, the entire building, kind of cladding it. And, uh, acting as its skeleton and it's just amazing to see that kind of being thrown up built in two years you know in incredibly rapidly and uh, yeah it's just great to see it from that point of view looking from inwards and look at it's central like London business. there as well I mean London looks so sort of business-like and grim doesn't it <laughs> by uh, by today's standards and this is it this is the steel structure going up yep that's it um, and I just remember, you know, when we first started talking about any kind of, you know, what images we wanted to put together, I think this really shows us just the scale of this structure compared to what you had at the time. I mean, you still have people in horse and, and cart going past this, you know, this is in the, it's in the twenties. So it was just unprecedented what they built there. And it's really something that you almost get kind of more excited to talk about because it's really pioneering. It's Doesn't it look so remarkable modern? to think that they had to they had to do this all above an, uh, an operating tube station? You know, yeah. That 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 in terms of engineering around those steel beams going on top of you know working tube lines is also sort of a feat of engineering that you just kind of mind bending to think about what kind of planning that had to had to involve. And also at the time, it must have been like a space shuttle was being landed in the middle of a Victorian area because this thing is so modern looking by comparison of the, to the other buildings that are in the area. Not now, but it was then. And it must have stuck out a mile. Oh, 100%. I mean, I actually remember seeing that building for the first time when I just moved to London. I was walking, trying to find St. James's Park Station's entrance and walked in there. 
And I remember walking into the entrance of Beautiful Broadway and somebody sort of scolding me and telling me to walk around the, the gallery. And I remember it really vividly because I was like, what is this building? What, like, I, you know, it was one of those kind of... Phenomenal building. And I love the fact you got the last laugh with that because all those years ago, you got told to go out of the door that you I weren't know. in. Now you've got the keys <laughs> for everywhere. I know, exactly. I mean, it, it was meant to be, just like the name Holloway, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. That's, uh, that's the, I think it's that the opening uh, pamphlet that they did, Chris? That's right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a booklet that was produced uh, for, for the opening of it. So there it is, proudly lit and looking statuesque uh, yeah. when it's brand new. And then when we started doing tours, we made our own little booklet which was written by Helen a uh, brilliant little kind of souvenir I've got it too I've got it too there you go. do you know I, I oddly don't have a copy oh <laughs> we'll send you some oh, yeah. we'll pop it in the post some. to you uh, <laughs> Alex the, the the doubly impressive thing about uh, about Helen doing that is she was she was writing it across the pond and that's why she uh, didn't get a copy to, to take with her but yeah we should sort that out Helen and get one sent to you. I noticed there were a lot of Z's yeah. instead of S's I did wonder what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> but now you use as well yeah. That is, of course, technically correct in the Oxford English Dictionary. That, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an assumption that it's an Americanism, and it's not true. <laughs> oh, God. It's always one, isn't there? Um, <laughs> so, so there we are, the cruciform from above. Mm -hmm. So that's what it looked like. And the building was actually designed for people to be able to cross through the... Um, through the... Oh, what am I trying to say? Through the... <laughs> Lift lobby, central. Lift lobby, thank you, through yeah. the lobby. So uh, had I tried to walk through there in 1929, uh, nobody would have stopped me because I would have been able to go straight through. One of the things that Helen always talked about is that, you know, how crazy it was to have lifts at this time. Do you want to yeah. elaborate? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's there lifts, there is four lifts plus a fifth service lift and two of the lifts just went up to it, what was it, to the third floor and the rest served the rest of the building up to the 10th floor. But I think an interesting connection here, um, connection with New York, is 55 Broadway was completed in 1929, and construction on the Empire State Building began just a few months later in March of 1930. And the same company that built the lifts for 55 Broadway, Otis, also designed the lifts for the Empire State Building. I was just recently working on the renovation project for their visitor experience. And, you know, when you think about riding 102 floors up in the sky, um, that the kind of transportation, the vertical transportation that Otis allowed for, I think is on that level of what London transportation was doing for cross, sort of cross urban transportation, Otis was doing for transportation up in the sky. You know, it, it, skyscrapers would not have been possible Without, without lifts. People. No, absolutely. Right. And I think there is, whenever you go to New York, I think, you know, you talk about looking down at your phone in London. My goodness, if you are foolish enough not to look up in New York, you are missing a trick. You are yeah, missing absolutely. a trick. Absolutely. Now. <laughs> and the, li the yeah, lifts here are also. Oh, look yeah, at that. So That's beautiful. I think what's also a really interesting little little tidbit here, and we'll probably talk about, about this a little bit more in a, in a few minutes, but um, sort of the something that really struck me about 55 Broadway is that um, it has a very um, well it's very much a reflection of the social stratification of the time and the social hierarchy of the time and that was quite literal also with the lifts because as, as often as is, is so with with skyscrapers is you have a bank of lifts that only goes so high and another bank that goes to the higher um, floors but what we found in our research is that often the, the very um, privileged executives, when they came to work, they weren't expected to ride a lift with anybody else. So once they showed up, you know, it was, hello, sir, and they could ride up to the, the seventh floor where their offices were without having to have, make any small talk with the riffraff. Wow, segregated lifts, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of the executives, here is the executive corridor on the seventh floor. And that is leading down from the, um, the chairman's office, now known as the district room, sort of down towards the lift. Beautiful panelling, sort of walnut panelling. And I mean, just the, the materials used for the building were extraordinary uh, and incredibly expensive and detailed. Um, 
And, you just uh, know, don't you, if you're walking down that corridor towards HR, you're likely to lose your job. Yep. <laughs> phenomenally um, powerful corridor there. It would have been quite scary and you probably wouldn't have entered through the main door you unless you were a guest of the chairman himself you would have entered through a side door into a secretary's office and then another secretary's office and then you would have been allowed by a side door to go into the big boss's office so <laughs> it's all kind of too yeah it's definitely kind of emblematic of that that hierarchy the, that society had at the time now that's the big boss's office oh i've been in there that's really oh. nice. Is that the pink room now? It's like a pink room these days. Isn't yes, it? it's got a pink ceiling um, and uh, these beautiful kind of windows that, sh that point towards Big Ben and, uh, and Westminster Abbey. Um, but that's where the, the chairman, Lord Ashfield, would have had, well, that was his office, basically. Yeah. And funnily enough, Helen and I have stood there <laughs> many moons ago. That's swanky. Look yeah. at that. <laughs> I love and that. Sidney, if, if you don't mind going back to the last picture, because there was something in an oral history we came across. Um, one of, I think he was, I can't remember his name, but I think he'd been a, a middle manager, had given us a little um, tip when he said, the higher up in, in Transport for London you went, the bigger your desk became. <laughs> so you can see the, that that's quite a large desk. <laughs> Epic, isn't it? Yeah. And speaking of desks, I'm really happy to say that the meeting table on the left is one which survived in a different part of the building until it closed uh, last year to uh, Transport for London, uh, Transport for London's use. Um, and uh, when the building was being cleared, that one has come uh, to the museum offices. So uh, my team regularly meet around that table uh, when, we're, when we're at work. He's such a magpie, that Nix, isn't he? Honestly, <laughs> half inch in everything. It just comes here, oh, yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I guess that's kind of what you have to do if you're the director of collections and engagement. Do right. <laughs> Can you imagine? He's the only person who's allowed to go into a room and nick stuff. I'm having that for my collection. He's always nicking stuff. That's it was part approved. Of, part of it's job. authorized. I have paperwork and everything. <laughs> authorized there. It gets better. <laughs> and there's the boardroom. Yeah. So I just. I put that in there just because um, you can see that beautiful walnut door leading into the boardroom of the London Underground but um, that room used to be divided in two and that would have been the first and the second uh, secretary's rooms before you got to the big boss's one just thought I'd throw that with you now just some lifts again um, just the beautiful art deco detailing on that bronze work is something that definitely should be sort of highlighted I think um, and just the way that they've actually lived for, you know, if they've been in, around for 90 years and they still look as pristine as that is quite a testament to the design. Well, I, I, perhaps it says something about my sense of taste, though, when it comes to architecture and things like that. But I look at these buildings, I look at tube stations and I just love the detail. I love the fact that somebody, somebody really, really clever, so much cleverer than me and knew what they were doing, made these stunning buildings that have stood the test of time. And I look at modern buildings these days, and sometimes I think, oh, they're nice. But most of the time, the buildings of this sort of heritage are the ones that I, I'm just wowed by. Yeah. I mean, they just, they're built to last in a sense that I don't know if we have that today to the same degree. I mean, that material has lasted beautifully for 90 years and will probably last for another 90 without, you know, particularly the marble and the floors. Just with the collections eye on it, when you, when you use really high quality materials, they they age well uh, that rather than being broken or scratched or damaged we call it patina uh you know it's um, <laughs> it, it adds to the character of it rather than takes away from it uh, and that's why it's lasted so well 90 years of uh, you know daily use and it still looks fabulous hope i look that good at 90. i was just thinking my cat's added patina to the uh mock it around the house and the scratches on the uh, garden posts so he's done very well really mm -hmm. now i uh, just wanted to show again that's another bay of lift but that's in the lobby and it just gives you a sense of like the grandeur of kind of walking up to the lifts and especially if you were a, an executive you would have a, have a you know a, a lift what steward i guess that would just take you up lift operator and that would take you up to your office um 
And then I just wanted to show you the other side of the building. We showed it, this, this is from um, Petit, the Petit France side. And lastly, there is Helen Dibniak looking at the marvellous view from the 14th floor. <laughs> this is yeah, my is city, she said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, I think this is the most epic photograph that has ever been taken of me. So I had to ask to get it into City Secret slideshow. <laughs> I'm about to, to take over. <laughs> Did There's he? a lovely one um, of me on a donkey on a beach. Can we have that in the slides? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, let's talk offline. Siddy, <laughs> could, you, could you go back to your slides, please? This is like the most and hysterical that, slideshow ever. The, the reason why I should go back to that is where you see those warm lights in the distance. That's an area which um, uh, Laura and I in particular really like. That door to the left. Laura, what's in there? So I was, you know, I was just thinking as we were going through these amazing pictures, I, um, I started my, my kind of life and career in London working at Broadway and I had um, a desk in an office on the ninth floor and um, I used to um, get to work and obviously this lobby bit here was always really, really busy when people first got there in the morning. So I always chose to take the, um, the stairs and you know, keep fit and healthy as well, nine floors of stairs. And I was just thinking in the back of my mind then that I used to go to the canteen, get a really, really nice breakfast and cup of tea, and then walk up those nine floors. And the staircase, I'm sure we've got an image of this as well. The staircase is phenomenal as well. And one of my favorite views is looking down over that lovely staircase and just the symmetry and the winding of it on the way down. I was literally just thinking that when you, uh, when you asked about the canteen, Chris. Isn't it lovely, right. all that little detail, because on that staircase as well, it's loads of old tube signs now. Absolutely, and that is yeah. Really lovely. I love that, you know? It's a building that where detail matters. If you look at that ceiling, it's so ornate. The uplighters, everything about it, even the, I'm sure you can tell me where even the stone came from around the lifts, which is all over the building anyway. It's just phenomenal, really. It's a beautiful building. And it's interesting, while we're talking about the interior, um, Helen and uh, uh, Laura, just, just give me an idea of your favourite. Look, Laura first. What is your favourite bit of the building? The, your very, very favourite. If you could take one thing, I mean, if Chris likes to procure, doesn't he, for his collections, but if you'd like to procure for your lounge, what would you have? Oh, that's tricky. That's tricky. I mean, my favourite shot is what I've just referred to before, that yeah. lovely winding staircase and looking down. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there is an original um, bronze, like letter shoot. I don't know the correct term for that, sorry. The cutler, um, the cutler shoots. Yes, and it's such mm -hmm. a beautiful, I mean, it's, yeah, it's still there. And I would, I would try and swipe that, I think. That would be my favorite bit. I love it. What about you, uh, Helen? Well, I would, I would take the view if I could. Um, yeah. The view is phenomenal, but since that's not, you can't put that in your pocket. Um, you know, there's actually, speaking of these sort of lovely details, there's these details, you can really only see them, I think, from the 10th floor. When you look outside the building, they're on the, the gutters. Oh, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. they're, you know, it's, what is it, Chris or City? You'll have to it's remind a, me. It's like the it's U-shape. It's a drain hopper. It? Yeah. yeah. The drain yeah. hopper, which has got the, the bullseye round all and the UD and the date. 1929. This is right, a perfect like, time very... actually. I was just thinking Helen, this is a perfect time to talk about the outside and before we do that I think um, we need to just go a little bit highbrow for a minute because um, you know we spend a lot of time giggling and looking around old buildings but this is very important and Chris um, we asked everybody to just put some glasses on didn't we because we thought it was really important so I've got my old um, uh, Joyce Grenfell glasses from 22 years ago that I put on. Uh, Chris, have you got glasses you can just put on there? Uh, I do, yes, <laughs> I, I'm ready. Um, They're well. lovely. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. And yep. Siddy, have you got yours? I do have my glasses. These oh, are my I'm actual fine. glasses. <laughs> and uh, Laura, where are yours? So, so these are mine, but... <laughs> I used to wear glasses and then I had my eyes lasered and these are my seven-year-old son's Harry Potter dress-up costume glasses well, but they're the only ones I could find and I heard it was imperative we had a pair for today so these are mine. I love the fact that you have given me that gag because to be honest I was about to say you look like Harry Potter and uh, <laughs> well, Helen know. what about yours? Yours look gorgeous as well. Where's mine? Helen? Is she there? 
Oh, sorry. I disappeared. I lost, oh, I lost nice. connection for a moment, but I'm That's back. sexy. They're wanna... very, very yeah, nice. Well you. done. Now, Chris, we've all, all put these very intelligent glasses on because there is a very intelligent discussion to be had about um, stuff, isn't there, outside there is. that we can there see. Is. Um, and I think we need to uh, queue up Siddy's uh, second slideshow now whilst we uh, we look at uh, the very important matter of the artwork which adorned the building. So. Um, as well as being beautifully detailed on the inside of the building, uh, that a lot of attention was placed on how to uh, bring the outside of the building to life. And uh, it wasn't just using fancy Portland stone and uh, high quality marbles and bronze work. Um, we also uh, are treated to a set of statues which were commissioned, or sculptures rather, which were uh, commissioned uh, and carved into uh, the stone on the side of the building. So, uh, Siddy, if you're ready to launch the first one. Yeah, let me see. Oh. Uh, Siddy, would you like to talk us through the winds, please? Oh, yes. heavens. <laughs> well, funnily enough, as you said, Chris, Fifth Fair Broadway was often nicknamed the Temple of the Winds, which I'm sure you, Alex, could find a uh, a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> no, to be honest, lay like that, he'll have wind, won't he? Um, but this is South Wind, uh, which was carved by um, Eric Amonier in situ, so hanging from, from, from the roof and carving it right there and then. And he sits on the north side of the building because it's the opposite, so South Wind is on the north side North sides on the south side, etc. We have to go ya ya a lot. Is it yeah. sort of ya ya ah? Yeah. <laughs> In um, ooh, okay. And is. this is <laughs> West she? Wind. I hope, I hope it's uh, a she. No giggling, no giggling. This is art. <laughs> this is West Wing. <laughs> is it? By uh, Sam Rabin or Sam Rabinovitz. And uh, again, carved in situ. Now, oh these beautiful sculptures were kind of an ornament of the building but there were two other sculptures done by Jacob Epstein that uh, caused quite a bit of controversy. Chris would you like to uh, elaborate further? Oh yeah so we are we are looking at a sculpture by uh, Jacob Epstein it's one of two uh, and this one is called Day. Uh, there was also on the uh, on the opposite side of the building uh, there's one called Night as well. Now this one uh, did court a good deal of controversy, as as City uh, City said, uh, and indeed, um, when commissioning artists, the only person who uh, Holden was forbidden from commissioning was Jacob Epstein because he he had done some uh, interesting and controversial uh, work before. But nonetheless, he commissioned him, uh, and uh, this provoked quite a lot of outcry, and it also caused us to have to do a good bit of uh, art research to know how to talk about this on the tours. Which bit particularly, Chris? <laughs> well, it, it's hard to put your finger on what caused most controversy, but um, it's, uh, it's the young gentleman depicted in the centre of the picture. Um, the length of the, uh, of the item uh, on display... Was, was it a cold day? <laughs> well, it's called, it's called day. Um, we, we had to find the correct artistic term uh, for the script. We initially, I think in the draft, if I remember correctly, Helen, I think we had it down as member, but then we discovered that in art, the correct term for it is the phallus. So, um, yes. the, the, so, so the right, whatever you do, was... do not put your own suggestions beneath, all right? Mm -hmm. Do not repeat, yeah. do not put your own <laughs> suggestions beneath. And um, <laughs> the matter was resolved, uh, public opinion was soothed by uh, removing, chiseling off about an inch and a half of the phallus. Uh, so by that time, but, uh, and that's when day became cold day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Don't go anywhere near We were near doing that so well there, <laughs> Wow. So that's so, the posh, you know, arty word, is it? Phallus. Phallus, yes. And, um, and, and I found, it, it, I've just found, um, um, can I read a quick quote that I found in the Manchester Guardian? Yes, so thank this, you. This, was, this is, was an, um, an opinion piece by um, Sir Edward Perry. And he wrote in this opinion piece that the monument 
The monuments of so repulsive a character may reasonably be expected to drive the man in the street underground and thus swell the revenues of the undertakings. Oh. So there were, this really was in the press, um, the, the art critics, such as we, were, were somewhat reserved <laughs> in their critique. Um, but the public really was in a, in a uh, uproar about it, which was very, very interesting. And it got to the point where um, the man who had forbidden Holden from recruiting uh, Epstein, uh, Frank Pick, although he had tried to avoid this, uh, ended up offering his resignation to Lord Ashfield uh, over the matter. His, his, re his uh, offer of resignation was declined, but uh, nonetheless, it had got that serious. Um, so never so much fuss has been made over such a small quantity of stone. Well, well you, you well. say small, you say small. <laughs> <laughs> now is it time for the weather yes it's time <laughs> can't and there we have to leave it okay i think we can probably remove our glasses now <laughs> thank goodness for that oh my <laughs> eyes are bleeding um we've included this just because we talked about the canteen earlier um they actually had this brilliant thing sorry i've got itchy nose um what which was uh they had a tiered structure as well as the executives and the officers the executives got a different canteen experience than the officers and then the regular staff. So here you see a regular staff restaurant or canteen, which was on the ground floor, the very same that Laura was talking about earlier and one which I dearly miss because it did have the best and most economic breakfast in central London. <laughs> it was really quite extraordinary. But um, this is what it looked like in the 50s, but this, is what it looked like in the 80s after a refurb. Well, can I be honest? Yes. I think I preferred the original. I am inclined to agree with you. I'm inclined. To I agree. feel like if I was sitting in there, I'd be waiting for a flight to take off. Yeah, or like, <laughs> it, it kind of looks like sort of an old, like, like a, an 80s cruise ship or something. <laughs> <laughs> if the designer is watching now, I am so sorry. Sorry, we know it was the zeitgeist at the time. I hope you we spent know. the money wisely. Acceptable right. for the 80s. Now, this is one of Laura's favourite parts and mine as well. Uh, the meadow. This is on the roof, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, genius. It's, it's quite lovely. They've got these solar panels there. They've got a little, yeah, little what we call the meadow basically just a little bit of grass and and you can actually go out onto the terraces on either on each one of the of the, wing, of the wings and and kind of have a little party which we have done uh in the past now this is Lego. Uh, Lego. Lego. Yeah, there you Th go. this was my photo so um uh, at our uh, London Transport Museum depot weekends, we often have model themed uh, weekends. And uh, it was only when I was going back through my, my photos, uh, I strayed across this one, which I'd, I'd forgotten I'd even taken uh, many years ago, where somebody had built uh, a Lego tribute to 55 Broadway. If you look at the bottom, you can see it's even got St. James's Park uh, platform nice. complete with a train. And I think it's a B-type bus uh, in front of it. So, I mean, they, they, there's, uh, the flag's a little large, but otherwise, I think that was an absolutely superb effort. Uh, and it's nice to see an icon being built in another icon. I love that. I mean, the size of the flag, I mean, if the wind caught, it'd probably blow the whole building over. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the, we were talking earlier about what the, the pieces of history that remain in the staircase right so this yeah. is one of them a stingemore map uh, of about 1932 um which we uh, well was there for quite some time um and alex if you'd have asked me which object i would take from the building uh it was that one and indeed in the clear out that has come to the museum collection um yeah. these maps are quite unusual uh, the amount of detail and fascination on that map is just incredible. So I'm delighted that that has come uh, to the museum collection now. I suppose uh, you've not got it hanging in your shed. <laughs> <laughs> not enough room. It's a big one. <laughs> Glorious. It's, well, it's, it's also a question for you guys. Do you know which tube station in London has one of these at it? Oh, good question. No? Any guesses? I've seen it, but I can't remember where. 
Oh, I, it's not in Piccadilly, is it? No, no. Good guess, though. Any guesses? Buzz in. <laughs> Temple. <laughs> yes, yes. I used to use it every day to go to university, Temple. I knew I'd seen it somewhere. There you go. Now, here we also have a very keen Chris Nix with a tiny torch showing us <laughs> where. <laughs> tiny torch, tiny torch. That does look like a publicity shot now, doesn't it? Um, I think, uh, <laughs> He's trying to find I, the screws to undo it. If I remember correctly, <laughs> what I'm pointing at is that there's this hand-painted edition on this. Map. There's a number of hand-painted editions, but the one I think I'm pointing at is the one that says next to St. James's Park, 55 Broadway. Uh, uh -huh. London Transport Headquarters. Uh, yeah, lovely map. Yeah. Now, there's the, there are the three of us looking out the window the, in the staircase. I just thought I'd throw in a couple of those. Uh, I think we're actually looking at Helen's favourite object, the, the yes. gutter, gutter thing. Yeah. <laughs> the gutter thing. Well, the, Still not got the picture of me on the donkey, though, has it? <laughs> this slide show? Next time, Alex, next time. Right, okay. Um, now, and again, <laughs> lots of photos. Here they are again. <laughs> Does the next photo do an inside pocket reveal? I mean, that's very catalogue, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? And you can buy it's this like, what? <laughs> Well, we did this, uh, this is a shoot, we basically, when we were planning for the tours, um, we would always have these, well, basically photo shoots where they needed just somebody to be in there to kind of show you know, people that, that you enjoy could be there too. Um, and this, on this particular occasion, it was Chris, Helen, and I at seven thirty in the morning because we had mm. to be there before all of the people that worked in the building actually got to work. So Fabulous. very early. And can I, can I just add that it was seven thirty in the morning after we'd been out a bit late the night before together. So yeah, little Dickie Bird tells me, Helen. Yeah, little Dickie Bird told me, <laughs> Helen, about the fact that you guys came up with your best ideas over Prosecco. Is that right? I can tell you, Nix has kept that tradition going with me. Yeah, strictly, absolutely. Strictly after absolutely, work, yeah. though. Strictly Always after work. After work. <laughs> Always after work. I, I will let you into a little secret about these hidden London hangouts, because although we encourage you guys to have a glass of wine as you watch this, or whatever you want to drink, Nix is very, very rigid about this and says, no alcohol, Absolutely no alcohol. So I have water. I have water. My body repels it usually, but um, today it's all <laughs> around the same. <laughs> well, but maybe people can't really yes. see what's what's in your mugs, though, can they? I mean, well, you're, I really I've your got my style, London mug. My... We get randomly style. tested. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can tell you it's water, but it might be whiskey. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you so much, City. You are welcome. That is awesome. And of course, Laura, nowadays, it's not 55 Broadway for London Transport. It's going to be a hotel, isn't it? It is. And, we, you know, we haven't run tours there now for um, a couple of months. And the last tour that we did do, um, a lot of the guides that had been guiding and a lot of the delivery team that had been um, you know, delivering those tours. Um, it was quite emotional and we did like a, you know, a last little tour and then had an event on the 10th, uh, the 10th floor because um, it was one of the first venues that we started running with Hidden London and now the building is going to be, you know, in a different guise. Um, you know, and I, like I said, I also started working there. So it was, it was an actual office for me as well. So now that it's gone, it is, um, you know, it is quite sad, but you know, there's a chapter in the book that the guys have written. We've got all these phenomenal photos as well. Um, it won't be forgotten for sure. It won't be forgotten. It's beautiful. And if you get the chance even just to walk past the place, just do it. Just do it because it is such an amazing building. It's glorious. And check out the guy on the cold day. That's all you've got to do. Go and have a look. Get out at St. James's Park and find the little man on a cold day. It's a perfect thing. Now, Thank you so much, Helen. You're a gem. Lovely to meet you. Uh, Siddy and Laura and Chris, an awesome wander through 55 Broadway. As always, notes and queries, but this is the best bit. Somebody has given us a set of four mugs to give away to one lucky viewer who can come up with an answer to our quiz. We're going to run this for a couple of weeks and all the details are below. Okay, so where you write your comments, where you subscribe, because you must subscribe. All the details are below, but Chris is going to tell us a little bit about how you win these amazing mugs, and just like these, these ones here. Uh, 
Yeah, and City's got a, a photo there of uh, the, look at that, box set uh, of the four uh, desi tiling designs, um, which uh, we've, we've talked about in the, in the weeks gone by uh, on these, uh, these hangouts. Now, we have a question for you. Um, for you to try and win this set of mugs. And City has got a second photo. Now, I was going through uh, some of uh, the things in my collection to see what might be a, a fun question. Uh, and I've got uh, a magazine, uh, a very old magazine, I won't tell you the, uh, the title of, um, from 1942, which shows uh, a film that was being made uh, during the war um, about uh, tube sheltering, and if you look very carefully, <laughs> I that, think you, I might, know. you might notice there are a few <laughs> things that aren't quite right for that to be a real tube station. Now, um, the film was called uh, "Confirm or Deny," uh, and that won't help you. But the question that we have for you is based on um, something which was written in the copy, which I'm going to quote for you. Um, says, does the scene of the ruin look quite convincing to you? Isn't there something quite queer about the tube track? The wall lights, the shelterers overflowing the platform. How many other little points of accuracy can you spot? Now, the one that we would like to set for our, uh, our viewers is, what is wrong with the track in the set of this film, given that it is supposed to be based on the London Underground Tube? Okay. I so love what you. is wrong with the track? I love you. I know the answer. And I know that loads of other people know the answers too. So what we need you to do is use the details below. We're going to get you to drop us an email. Okay. And uh, we will pick at random one of those in a couple of weeks time. All right. The expiry dates, the closing dates, all the terms and conditions are beneath us right now. And uh, those mugs are lovely. I've got one. Uh, we've all got one actually, haven't we? We have. I I do occasionally whip out my Johnson, but then I've also got the Hidden London mug as well. So it's fantastic. A set of four mugs uh, can be yours if you can spot what is wrong with the track in that shot. Okay, details below. Uh, James Curley sent us a question on YouTube. Hello, James. Um, he said, what's the oldest artifact in the London Transport Museum collection? Chris, what have you nicked that's the oldest? <laughs> Well, uh, we have some wonderful donated items into, uh, into the collection. Um, again, that's a, that's a really interesting question because uh, there's several ways that you can answer it. Um, if you look at a library collection, we've got some lovely old uh, written materials. Um, the oldest written material, I will have to just consult here, um, Carey's New Guide for Ascertaining Hackney Coach Fairs. Anyway. Well, they are. And that's just the main title. The, the <laughs> subtitle for it goes on and on and on and on, as does. Um, now, this one is actually quite a good read. Uh, oh, sorry, that one was from 1801. Um, the, um, the slightly later one from 1839 was Mogg's Handbook for Railway Travellers, uh, which I believe uh, still has quite a lot of advice that modern day uh, tube travellers would find, uh, find useful. But um, the oldest physical object we think uh, is um, a, a 1780 or thereabouts sedan chair, which you'll see on open display uh, when you first enter the museum in our Victorian gallery once we're back open. But I reckon there's actually something even older in our Digging Deeper gallery. Um, oh yeah, I was thinking of that. <laughs> and I actually have um, a, a sample from a slightly different place here myself. And it's, it's this, um, London Clay. I've got that as well. So the, um, we have a sample from the King William Street work sites, which although they were 1890, that was being dug. The, lay, the clay, of course, is way older than that. So geologically speaking, I think the clay probably wins. Uh, my sample, uh, and indeed the, the sample that you have, Alex, is, um, is from slightly further up from when I visited the bank uh, extension works, which tunnels out of the side of King William Street. So that's, that is from the edge of King William Street. So that's back to 1890. 
1890. And I, I want to tell this story, actually, because we were, Chris and I were introduced by a very, very good friend of mine. And he said to me at a party, you need to meet Chris because he's just the most amazing bloke and you will get on well. And we are, we are just the best friends. And what I loved about it was one day we were going out for a bite to eat and a tour around the tube station and then a bottle of Prosecco afterwards. And he said to me, I've got a little gift for you. And he handed me a business card box with a piece of the London clay from King William Street station. And not only was I elated that someone cared enough to give me something so lovely, but he had a Dymo label writer and he'd written on the box. And I thought his attention to detail, his thoughtfulness with gifts, this man, he's gonna be a great friend of mine. So that is why Chris and I are such good friends because he just gives the best gifts. And um, we've got a message as well from Malcolm Peck. Um, well, there is Jeff Carson, actually, before that on YouTube. He said, when you did Clapham South, lovely show, by the way, but your union flag was up the wrong way. Siddy? Yeah. Chris? <laughs> well, I mean, normally you display a flag uh, upside down uh, if you're in distress. And I think, Laura, that was how we <laughs> felt when, <laughs> when, on that first day when we were putting it together. So there you are, it's subliminal. Well, yeah, spotted, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to say we uh, we were rushing or hurrying, but the, the, that might have been a slight oversight at the time. Sorry. I love it. Jeff, we love you. And Malcolm Peck um, left his message on YouTube as well. He said, absolutely brilliant, guys. Loving the home format. And I want a shed like Chris's. We all want a shed like Chris's. Um, if nothing else, I just quite like a chair, so I don't have to sit on the floor in the lounge for 45 minutes. Uh, but uh, only found out about these from the Friends email newsletter. When I was about 14, back in 1970, we lived directly above the Piccadilly line section between Turnpike Lane and Manor House. We got used to it, but whenever Friends came, they could hear the rumble of the tubes. And I think that's the best place to live, isn't it? Somewhere where you get a little bit of a shudder at night when Coronation Street comes on. I think it'd be quite nice, wouldn't it, Laura? You know, I was thinking about this the other day as well, because um, I live by an overground track and we're not, we're not so close that I can hear it that often, but there is something really comforting about that, you know, that kind of like that, that noise. Um, but maybe living directly above it, you know, I get where they're coming from. I absolutely love it. Helen, how close to the uh, subway do you live? I actually live very close to four different subways, the two and three train and the B and the Q. And we hear, we can feel the rumble constantly. A beautiful, again, beautiful it's kind of, it's experience. Kind of yeah. Helen, it's been delightful. Thank you so much for joining us. Maybe pop back and join us another time, yeah? I love that. It's been a pleasure. Great stuff. Siddy, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Laura Hilton Brown, thank you so much for coming along as well. No, thank you. These hangouts are really good fun. So I hope everyone continues to enjoy them and stay well. And Chris Nix, as always, thank you so much for my London clay and also for looking like a ticket collector at Kentish Town Tube. Thanks, Alex. Great to see you all. And I thought I'd stay here till the end on this one. Thanks. <laughs> Very sweet of you to do that. So uh, just to let you know, subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel. Leave your comments and suggestions below. Also, enter the competition. We'd love you to win those mugs. Don't forget to follow Chris Nix and City Holloway and myself, Alex Grundon, on Instagram. Come and join the party. And also the LT Museum on Instagram as well. My name's Alex Grundon. Thank you so much for joining us as we went up instead of down. And we'll be back again next week. Have yourself a great day and stay safe.